Hello there! Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing really, really well, and life is being good to you, and um, just I hope you're having a fabulous evening. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up, and we're on the final part of the story. So let's continue with part four of our story. Aunt Heidi was wonderful to me. She was very sympathetic towards me and understood what I was going through. She made me feel right at home and soon became like a second mother to me. I naturally missed all my friends from Spokane, most especially my close friend Ivan, whom I had not seen in quite some while. My mother was of course not best pleased when I invited him to spend the weekend with us. Sweetheart, must you invite Ivan around? She asked me lamely. I just don't think it's a good idea. Why not? I demanded. I know you don't like him, Mum. You've never liked him. But he's my friend. Because, love, he's into all that, you know, all that really weird stuff that I just don't approve of. He's interested in the occult, Mum. Why don't you just say it? Big deal. He's not hurting anyone, is he? Everyone's entitled to have a passion. It is a big deal, love. It might seem innocent fun to you, but you can open doors to the demonic realms when you play with stuff like that. You can invite grievous trouble into your life, and after the fiasco of your father's passing, that is the last thing we need right now. Really, Mum? Are you for real? You don't really believe in all that woo-woo stuff, do you? I'm afraid I do, love. Furthermore, I don't think that Ivan is a positive influence on you. I'm sorry I don't. There it is, I've said it. I know it's not what you want to hear, but it needs to be said. When he was around, you were always listening to all that heavy metal music, and I'm sure it was because of his influences. It drove your father absolutely mad, as it did me. I may remind you, that Ivan was slipping into cemeteries at the dead of night to talk to the dead. How do I know this? Because his mother confided in me about it. She told me everything. It freaked her the hell out. You have to admit, love, that is not normal behaviour for a teenager. She caught him using one of those Ouija boards, would you believe it? Sometimes you teenagers have absolutely no idea what you're dabbling with. As common sense absolutely eludes you. I've seen it all the time. Poor Ivan's mother. She went through a hellish time, I can tell you. Very upset about the whole debacle she was. Luckily, she got Ivan to speak to her pastor. Her pastor had a good talk with him. But my bet is he hasn't changed in the slightest. I put money on it. That's why I don't want him staying with us. I think I'm being perfectly reasonable about this. Don't be so mean about Ivan, Mum. You don't know him like I do. And he's got a good heart. I know he isn't everybody's cup of tea, but I like him a lot. It's not up to you to choose my friends, is it? Ivan and I, we go back a long time. He's like a brother to me. And so what if he's interested in cemeteries and stuff like that? It doesn't make him a bad person. He's just got an inquiring mind, that's all. He's interested in things you can't explain. And what's wrong with that? He's not hurting anyone. An inquiring mind? Is that what you call it, love? My mother scoffed. You know what? I blame those dreadful television programs on TV. With their ghost documentaries and investigations. Feeding this generation with wild, nonsensical ideas that should be actively in discouraged instead of encouraged in the way they are. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that Ivan is wild about the paranormal. It's ridiculous. Don't be so hard on Austin, Sammy, said my Aunt Heidi, coming to my immediate defence. She was good like that. Austin's entitled to have his own friends to stay if he wants to. This is my house, so I have the final say, I'd like to think. You shouldn't come down on him so hard. When we were kids, we were both fascinated by ghost stories, so I think it's perfectly natural for teenagers to be interested in cemeteries and stuff like that. We weren't much 
different at that age, I'd like to remind you, Sammy. I was never interested in ghosts, said my mother defensively. I wouldn't be seen dead exploring a cemetery at the dead of night. Are you kidding me? It's outrageous. That's what it is. That's a maybe, chuckled my aunt. But I'll tell you one thing for nothing, sis. You were always asking Pops to tell us ghost stories. So go on, let Ivan stay here. What harm can it do? Teenagers will be teenagers. Very well, said my mother. But watch yourself around, Ivan, son. That's all I'm saying. She pointed an accusing finger at me, as if she'd caught me with my hand in the cookie jar. But I didn't care one jot. At least Ivan was coming to stay, and that was all that mattered. When Ivan arrived at Aunt Heidi's house, I was thrilled to see him again. It had been so long. Ivan was enchanted by the unassuming town in which we lived, with its rural vibe and scenic views. I think he was extremely glad, if the truth be told, to get away from Spokane. We were as close as brothers, always had been, since we were teeny boppers, and he was the only person that knew all about my father's untimely death and how I'd accidentally killed him. When I told him what had happened that dreadful night, when everything in my life went into a wild spin like a ferris wheel at a playground that falls apart on its own accord, he took it remarkably well and remained true, faithful and loyal to me as a friend. Your mum's to blame, bro. If it hadn't been for that power failure, then you would have seen that the man shaking your mother was actually your dad. It was so dark in your house that night. You couldn't see a thing. And you panicked, especially when you heard that noise, because you thought that thug in our neighbourhood had broken in and was holding your mother to ransom. Furthermore, your mum cheated on your dad with this old lover of hers. It's disgusting if you ask me. It's no wonder your poor father cried out like a strangled animal in distress. You mark my words, if your mother paid her bills on time and had not cheated on your dad in the way she did, None of this would have happened. She's entirely to blame for your father's demise. You were the innocent party in all this, as was your sister and your father. I hope your mother's proud of herself for what she's done to your family. I knew that Ivan had a point, but I still blamed myself for my dad's untimely passing. If my mother knew I'd confided in Ivan on the matter, about this strictly confidential and private family matter... She would have probably done her nut. But what she failed to appreciate was that Ivan was family to me. I knew I could trust Ivan with my life, and he would never betray me. My Aunt Heidi was warmly welcoming to Ivan when he arrived at her rather humdrum, mediocre and very brand-looking house. You know the sort of very unexceptional beige-looking affair that looks more like one of those old gas stations from the early 70s that you would see in the movies? that you find situated somewhere in the sticks. Without wishing to be unkind, Aunt Heidi's house looked a little frayed and tired, worn at the edges, as if it had had a very hard life. My Aunt Heidi made no secret of the fact that she was not remotely domesticated. She had zero style, so the house she lived in was a cookie-cutter version of many houses in these parts that lacked charm, charisma, personality and individuality as if someone who'd built a collection of these houses at the time had done so with only practicality in mind and had not considered that it might be rather nice to have a house that was pleasing on the eye. My Aunt Heidi never believed houses should be anything but purposely functional, but I hasten to say what her house lacked for in beauty, the outside world more than compensated by splashing the countryside in seasonally rich colours in both spring, summer and autumn while winters were always reasonably dramatic. You only had to glance outside the windows at the prepossessing views to forget about the drab, mismatched, less-than-glamorous furnishings in the house that Aunt Heidi looked like she'd picked up from garage sales and thrift stores. Aunt Heidi was a very tactful person, was politely reserved at all times. She tended to keep her thoughts to herself. She was stiff upper lip and very ordered in everything she did. I was not surprised she had worked for the sheriff's office at one point. 
She and my mother were the antithesis of each other in every way, but their startling big differences seemed to be complementary to their relationship. When my father died, Aunt Heidi handled everything so efficiently, as if handling a dead body was pretty routine for her, but I suppose in a manner of speaking it was. She admitted she'd seen a few dead bodies in her time, so it didn't creep her out the way it did us. "'Your father's gone now,' she said so matter-of-factly. "'This is just his meat suit. It's not him any more.' Then she said, "'Well, let's get on with this, shall we? We have a body to bury. No point in dawdling about this, is there? And quit being emotional. The milk has already been spilled, so it's far too late for any regrets.' Aunt Heidi surprised me by throwing her arms around Ivan and expressing her incredible pleasure to meet him. I think she believed my mother's attitude towards Ivan was completely unreasonable, even if he did dabble in the occult. Out of the two sisters, Aunt Heidi had always been the sensible one, whereas my mother allowed her emotions to govern her thoughts at most times. It's good to see you, Ivan, she told him. "'Austin has told me all about you.' "'Oh, good, I hope,' said Ivan cheekily, giving my arm to wink. "'He gave my mother a charmed smile and said, "'How are you doing, Mrs. Harris?' "'My mother just glared at him, like a cat who takes a distinct dislike to a member of the family "'and would seriously like to scratch their eyes out. "'Hello, Ivan,' she said coldly. "'It's been a while, has it not?' It sure has, Mrs. Harris. Mum sends you all her love, by the way. And, oh, thanks for letting me stay. To be honest, I think she's glad to get rid of me for a couple of days. I bet she is, said my mother. Before my mother could continue with any more sarcasm, it was Aunt Heidi who interjected as quickly as she could. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Ivan. We're delighted to have you stay with us for the weekend. I do know that Austin has missed you awfully, and it's going to be good for him having you around. There are lots of exciting things to do around here, in terms of hiking and exploring, but I'm sure Austin has told you all about it. I know we're a little out in the sticks here, Ivan, but for the adventure seeker like yourself, you're going to have a lot of fun with us this weekend. I'm excited to be here, and I'm eager to go fishing. Good, I'm glad to hear that. You'll find all the tackle that you need in the shed. My mother remained aloof towards my visitor, and Ivan picked up on her unwelcoming manner, which was rather unfortunate. What's wrong with your mum? he asked me when we were alone in my bedroom. She's been standoffish towards me since I arrived. I could swear she's glaring at me all the time. Have I done something to work her or something? I think she's freaking out. She thinks you're a bad influence on me because of your interest in the occult, I said. Ivan rolled his eyes in the back of his head in exasperation. Ha! Huh, I knew it. I might have guessed. My mother's been blabbing as usual to your mother, putting the knife in as she always does. Do you know she actually dragged me to Pastor Lee, kicking and screaming. Well, not really, but you know what I mean. Let's just say I wasn't remotely happy to see the pastor. Oh, Pastor Lee, he went on and on. He gave me a lecture about the dangers of talking to the dead. And he went on and on about my using a Ouija board and how upset I'd made my mother. I've never seen my mother so angry before. She burnt up my Ouija board. Can you believe that? She also bolted the windows in my bedroom shut. Even Dad said she'd gone over the top. So I wasn't able to slip out during the night to go to the cemetery. But then I guess that's old news to you. Because you know about all that. Because my mother's been gassing to your mother, I suspect. Like they always do. I do know everything. I laughed. I never heard the end of it from my mother, who kept telling me not to be friends with you, because you're a bad influence on me. That's never going to stop me being friends with you. And you know that. Well, that explains why she's been so bitter towards me, said Ivan. I'm a regular teenager just like you, and if she can't see that, she's as blind as a bat. Well, guess what? I bought another Ouija board along with me today, said Ivan excitedly, his eyes growing round with enthusiasm. 
I buried it beneath some of my sweaters in my weekend travel bag so my mother couldn't see it because she's always snooping. She rarely believes I've given up all that stuff and that I listened to Pastor Lee. If my mother found this Ouija board, she'd absolutely lose it. But what she doesn't know won't hurt her. She always overreacts to everything I do. She thinks I'm going to invite a demon into our house if I play with a Ouija board. But I'm not stupid. I know what I'm doing. I was rather bemused to discover that Ivan had bought a Ouija board with him on this trip. Why would you do that? You know what my mother feels about those things. She reacts like your mum does. If she knew, she'd absolutely flip. That's because your mother is rigidly stiff just like mine is. But your Aunt Heidi's super cool. Ivan chuckled. I got the Ouija board for you, bro, as a gift, if you must know. I figured you'd find it rather useful. Like a tool, you know, to bring you some closure over your dad's untimely passing. We can connect with your father on it. You have an opportunity to tell him how sorry you are for what happened that night. You can make your peace with him that way. Remember you told me you wished you could do that. Now is your opportunity. But doesn't he know that already? I asked. Surely the dead know everything. He'd know I didn't hurt him on purpose. I said, feeling the back of my throat suddenly becoming rather dry and my eyes moistening with tears of great regret. I'm not sure the dead do know these things. I don't think they know everything, said Ivan, looking reflective. I think that's a myth, you know, a common misunderstanding. Do you know I heard from a reliable source that some dead people don't even know they're dead, and that they're restless spirits wandering around very confused. They are like this often if they've died very suddenly and unexpectedly, like in a car accident, or like your dad did when you beat him across the head. Imagine if your dad's spirit is wandering around that wood grove where he's been buried. He might be wondering what the hell he's doing there, or what actually happened to him. Maybe he doesn't even know he's dead. Your dad died so suddenly. Remember that. I suppose he did, I agreed. I mean, after I hit him with that bat. He was a goner. It was an immediate death. Well, there you go, then. He wasn't prepared to die, was he? I'm sure you want your dad to be at peace and to cross over to the other side without feeling that he's got unfinished business on this side. He could be worrying, couldn't he, about you and your sister? And that could be a stumbling block for him, holding him back from crossing over, don't you think? I mean, imagine if you're a father and you're taken away prematurely from your kids. Wouldn't you want to hang around to protect your family? I know I would. You think he's wandering around the grove, confused? I asked, finding the idea extremely unsettling. If this was true, I was responsible, not only for my dad's early demise, but his distress after death. And this was a very unsettling thought indeed. I knew Ivan knew all about the occult. He seemed to know much about the long since deceased. So if he intrinsically believed my dad had become a restless spirit, why should I doubt him on that? For I knew nothing at all about the spirit world. Ivan shrugged his shoulders rather nonchalantly. Well, you don't know, do you? That's the point. If we contact your father on the Ouija board, you can make your peace with him. You can tell him that you will look after your sister and your mother for him. You can give him that reassurance that he needs. So he doesn't have to stay around. He's free to cross over to the other side. You're giving him a gift. You can tell him you'll be the man of the house from now on. I think it will bring your father the closure and the relief he needs. You've suffered a lot since your father died. You've been blaming yourself for what happened, when none of this was your fault. But I think if you speak to your father, you will realise that even though he's gone, he's still very much around, and that he doesn't blame you for any of this. You think this is a good idea? You think we should do this? Contact my father through the Ouija board? Will he even respond to us? Of course he will! And it's a great idea! You want answers, don't you? I'm sure this is going to give you some peace. But are you sure we can contact him on the spirit board? But of course we can. 
We can slip out of the house and sneak into the wood grove together at night to find the spot where he was buried, because then we'll be in close contact to him. I'm sure we'll get a response from him. If that doesn't work, well, you could book a session with a renowned psychic. There is an excellent psychic in Spokane, but she charges big bucks for her sessions. It's best to bypass the middleman, don't you think? I nodded. But why can't we do this during the day? I asked. I'm not comfortable about going to the woods at night. It could be rather creepy. You have no idea how menacing the woods can look during the witching hours. Aunt Heidi has told us to stay away from the woods at night. The only time I've been there was when we buried Dad. And yes, it was a magical night, but it was still creepy. She claims to have heard strange noises coming from those woods. But we have to go at night, bro, don't you see that? There's too much distraction during the day. When I went into the graveyard at night with the spirit board on my own, without anybody else around, you can't believe the excellent responses I got from the deceased, from those very graves. But during the day, there's far too much going on. Besides, if your mum knew what we were doing, she'd absolutely lose it like my mother. Those two are two birds of a feather. If we sneak out into the grove at night, they won't know a single thing about this, will they? Ivan pulled a face. I know everything looks formidable at night, but I've brought along torches for us to see our way clearly. And you never know, it might even be an adventure. I think we'll actually have fun. It'll be exciting. I was reluctant about going to the wood grove at night with a Ouija board. I'm afraid to say I've never been as adventurous, you know, as Ivan is. In truth, the idea I found rather discomposing, especially as people like my mother believed that playing with a Ouija board could invite demonic spirits into our lives. But Ivan kept reassuring me that this would never happen. He must know what he was talking about, I thought. He said if we surrounded ourselves with love and light, well, we would be absolutely fine. And his brazen confidence calmed the storms of my disease. The long and the short of it was that Ivan was right. I desperately needed closure after my father's passing. And if doing this meant I could get my message across to him, then I was very keen to do this. There are no words I can use to describe how much I dreadfully missed my late father. And when you're desperate enough to get in contact with someone that has left their physical body, you'll be surprised by what you are willing to do. It was at about ten past one in the morning that Ivan began to joke me wide awake. I woke up with a start, realising why it was I had been rudely woken out of my sleep. I really didn't want to get up at this time, but Ivan's eager, resolutely determined face inspired me to arise from my slumber, even if it was rather reluctantly. "'Are you ready, Austin?' he whispered urgently. "'You need to be exceptionally quiet. We don't want to wake anyone up in your household, especially not your mother, given she suffers from insomnia.' "'so we have to be twice as careful.' "'I groaned, wiping my hand across my face, "'where beads of perspiration appeared to have broken out, "'because I was nervous about this whole ordeal. "'I'm not sure I can do this, Ivan. "'I'm really scared. "'I'm scared of using the spirit board. "'I'm scared of going into the woods at this hour. "'Can't we just not do it? "'I just don't think I can do it. "'Bro, I promise you, that everything's going to be fine. I've done this lots of times before, and I'm okay, aren't I? You'll be thanking me after tonight. This little experiment is going to bring you so much peace, and you want that, don't you? I suppose I do, but I'm scared if we conjure up a demon. What if we do that? We're not going to conjure up a demon. That's crazy. Your mum's been filling your head with all the stuff my mother's been saying. I've done this lots and lots of times and nothing's happened to me and I'm fine. Ouija boards get a bad rap, that's all. If you know how to use them, you won't invite evil into your life. It's that simple. You just won't. You need to know what you're doing, that's all. And I know what I'm doing. You've got nothing to worry about. We've got to do this. I know you're going to be thankful that we did. Ivan's words were rather reassuring. We quickly put our tracksuits and sneakers on and then quietly tiptoed down the hallway, 
making our way out of the kitchen. I was absolutely petrified my mother would be up and about. But I do know that she'd been taking some sleeping medication of late to help with her raging insomnia, and it appeared to be working, although her doctor warned her that she could become addicted to it. It was after my dad's death my mother knew she needed a helping hand in that regard, as her sleeping patterns had become even more splintered. I found Aunt Heidi's kitchen key. It was in the little chef-shaped cookie jar on the counter, which seemed to stare at us menacingly in the half-light, which did little to calm my rather flustered nerves. In truth, Aunt Heidi hardly ever kept the kitchen door locked. That was until we moved in, of course, when my mother was increasingly more nervous about leaving any door slightly open. So I opened the door very slowly, allowing a cool breeze to enter the room. It was early spring, so it was sometimes quite cool in the mornings and evenings. The door swung open with an ominous unwelcome creak that was so loud I was worried it would wake my mother up, but there was no sound coming from inside the house, so it seemed like the coast was clear. It was colder outside than I imagined it would be. Ivan handed me a torch and took one for himself, and we headed very steadily down my aunt's rather hilly backyard towards the woods. I was glad to see that a generous almost full moon splashed her mystical illumination across the countryside, so that things did not seem quite so daunting as I'd expected them to be. But my relief, I'm afraid to say, was rather short-lived. The wailing noises of the wind did nothing to silence the blistered anxiety of my trepidation that seemed to have nestled in my throat like a bird's nest stuck down a chimney. I could feel the cold air penetrate my tracksuit, which was rather unfortunate, rather like water in a lake that soaks through your clothing, causing you to shiver uncontrollably. My shivering was probably more to do with nerves than with cold. I was beginning to regret that I was not more warmly attired. Before long we were ambling down the windy rocky path through the trees, with me leading the way to my father's resting place. It felt as if the woods were closing in on us, rather like a conniving pack of wolves that were circling their prey. There was something inauspiciously bodeful about the woods that night, but I persuaded myself that it was all in my head. I mean, we could hear the tuneful chorus of crickets and frogs. That had to be a good thing, surely. It was significantly darker, I'm afraid to say, when we entered the heart of the woods, which was dappled with the pessimistic stench of a bone-chilling disquiet, one that I cannot describe to you. Somehow it felt all wrong coming here in the middle of the night like this, and a little voice inside me told me to go back home, but I couldn't listen to it. I glanced briefly at Ivan for some kind of reassurance. He was carrying the duffel bag over his shoulders that contained the Ouija board. I noticed he didn't appear to be the slightest bit dismayed by the unsettling gloomy ambience in the woods. Indeed, he looked as if he was going for a leisurely stroll and was rather enjoying himself. How could he be so calm and composed, I wondered. If he was not being freaked out, then what on earth was wrong with me? I was seventeen years old, for goodness sake. I wasn't a baby, nor was I a scaredy cat, so I needed to grow a pair. And stop being such a douchebag. I didn't want Ivan to see the wavering doubt that was clinging to me with every single step we took deeper and deeper into the woods. I had this discommoding feeling that we were not alone and that something or someone was watching us. I kept glancing very nervously behind my shoulders as I was sure something was there. I could feel something. I would thrust my torchlight over the tangled foliage and shrubbery to see if I could see any sign of movement but I wasn't rewarded with anything. All I could hear was the whisper of the wind, but that seemed to be conspiring against us, and it was as if the trees themselves knew all too well what we intended to do, almost as if our deepest secrets had all been unveiled. I didn't feel remotely welcome in this place. It felt sinister. At one point I nearly screamed when two raccoons went charging past us in a frantic, desperate rush. They barely even seemed to notice us. In fact, I wonder if they did at all. They seemed to be affrighted by something. But what? I could not imagine. Should we be concerned, I wondered. 
At one point in the wood grove, we heard this loud wailing sound, which had nothing to do with the wind at all. This was something infinitely worse. It made me jump out of my skin. The sound returned again and again. There were more wails that echoed through the woods. The sound turned my blood icy cold. What the hell is that, Ivan? I said, feeling a charge of electricity pulsate through me. So every hair on the back of my body was now standing on end. I was terrified. I looked at my friend with the frighted eyes. Of course I heard it, said Ivan, chuckling. Don't you know woods are notorious for making weird noises? You hear about it all the time. It's probably just a wild animal crying out. I know it sounds like a woman being killed, but I promise you it's not. When I used to slip out to the cemetery at night, you wouldn't believe the noises I would hear. They were very scary, but you can't let them get to you. You've got to overcome your imagination, because that can steal your courage. I don't know. I just feel uncomfortable being in the woods. Something doesn't feel right. I feel scared. I feel as if something is watching us. That's because your imagination is in overdrive. I warned you about that. You've got to focus on just walking to the gravesite. Then you'll be all right. Don't let your imagination get the better of you. I wanted to believe Ivan was right. But something crawling inside me was making me feel certain that we were not alone and that something or someone was watching us. I was sure of it. Worse still, the crickets and frogs had suddenly become mute, and that was not a good sign. Everything had become so much quieter. It was as if we had become the actors on the stage, and the woodgrove had turned its attention directly on us, as if it had become our audience. We were the actors about to play our parts. I was absolutely sure I could occasionally hear... Beyond the rustle of the wind, wood knocks, screams, and the breaking of twigs and branches, but Ivan appeared to be tuning it all out, as if it was water off a duck's back for him. His oblivious indifference to the strange noises around us made me feel very self-conscious and rather foolish. I was overreacting to the sounds in the woods, and Ivan was absolutely right. Before long, we reached the little clearing between the trees, where my father was buried. It was reassuring being close to his gravesite, almost as if he was watching over us, and I felt immeasurable relief. I walked over to the tree and pointed to a spot where a single white stone was strategically placed, marking my father's grave. He's over there, where the white stone is. That's his grave. A rush of emotions overwhelmed me as I stooped down lovingly to touch the stone. Hi, Dad, I whispered. I really miss you. Let's get started, shall we, said Ivan, as we sat down on the ground with torches at our side and with the opening between the trees. Very generous, so that moonlight spilled down upon us, rather like the sunshine on a warm day. And for a brief moment, I can honestly say this, all my worries were washed away by the ethereal magic of this quintessential moment. In a trice we got down to business, and Ivan laid out the Ouija board on the ground. We began to play with the board, with our hands both on the blanchette, which began to move on its own accord. And this strange cryptic phenomenon really rather rattled me. Why are you moving the blanchette, Ivan? I complained. I'm not moving it! It's moving on its own! It's perfectly natural. That's what you expect to happen. Is anyone here? asked Ivan. And the Blanchard moved to yes. It was this response that had me jiggling nervously, doubting at once that what we were doing was a good idea after all. But it was too late to express my misgivings now. Ask a question, Ivan encouraged me. Dad, is that you? I cried out. The Blanchet moved to yes. I was now very excited. I had connected with my dad. My heart began to race in my chest. This was my opportunity of making contact with my father. Was he really here with us now? Dad, are you at peace? I asked. The Blanchet moved to yes. What a relief that was to hear. 
Before we could get any further with our questioning, we heard a loud screeching roar that was so blearingly ear-piercing. I felt as if this inharmonious sound was shaking every single cell in my body. I was so petrified that my fingers fell off the blanchet. My body began to tremble like a blamage jelly. And I became pretty useless, I have to say. Something's there, Ivan. I know something's there. I can feel it. Oh, my God. I'm sure something is there. We need to get out of this woods now. We need to stop this now. We need to go. Ivan had grown as white as a sheet. His mouth dropped open. His eyes grew wide. He appeared to be looking at something. And the fear in his eyes was so contagious, like a deadly disease. His convoluted gaze affirmed to me my very worst fears. Something was definitely there. I hadn't been wrong about that. I glanced behind me, trying to focus on my gaze on what it was that Ivan appeared to have seen. But as I did so, a large, dark silhouette, with an untamed wild roar, came racing through the trees, screaming with such indignation that I just froze to the spot. My body became like an idle, incompetent doormat that could be easily trodden upon, or like a solid, freckless statue that can't move a single inch. I was totally unresponsive to the situation of which I found myself embodied. I knew I needed to escape, but I was almost resigned to my impending fate, as if I knew this was it for me and for my good friend Ivan. I was so enfeebled and impaired by the incapacitating effects of a dizzying fear that I froze to the spot, and then there he was, standing before me, only feet away from us. He was beating his ponderous chest with his fists, glaring at us with furiously enraged red eyes, and with the moonlight casting its light on the creature's gargantuan lordly form, I realised that I was staring at a Bigfoot. There are no words to describe this daunting creature, for never in my entire life have I ever encountered something so threatening. The Bigfoot stood up on two formidable tree-trunk-sized legs, that looked so stocky and burly. I'm certain if he wanted to, he could kick a vehicle right over. His hair was as black as the night. The shape of his body was made out of the fabric of your darkest, most intimidating, inhospitable nightmares. For a moment, I even thought we had conjured up a demon from the Ouija board that was pretending to be my father, because the Bigfoot was like a giant man, covered in hair. I cannot describe the rage that came off this creature. I was now certain we were going to die. This Bigfoot was going to kill us. There was no doubt about this in my mind, that this would be our plight. Even if me and Ivan managed to run away from the creature as fast as we possibly could, I was certain we were doomed. Ivan grabbed me by the hand. He pulled me to my feet. Run! he bellowed. Run! Me and Ivan began to run. I was like an old battered car parked in the driveway, stalling precariously, that suddenly just jerked into life by magic. My legs seemed to miraculously find a life of their own. I've never been able to replicate how fast I ran through the woods that night. I managed to grab my torch, and without it I'm not sure how I would have found my way through the impenetrable bleak darkness the trees had injected into the woods with their boughs that cruelly blocked out all the light. The Bigfoot was hurriedly gaining ground on us. I could hear his heavy breathing and his loud screams and the way his feet pounded and vibrated across the forest floor. He was getting far too close for comfort. I thought we were about to die. I was certain of it. Once we left the wood grove, embraced by the light of the full moon, the Bigfoot remained on the edge of the woods, watching us. He had stopped chasing us. I don't think Ivan and I slowed down a single second. We ran until we safely made our way into the house. I do not know how we didn't wake up our entire household. For once we entered my bedroom, we both broke down into floods of tears, feeling certain we had escaped death by a hair's breath. I leaned out of the bedroom window and glanced towards the woodgrove, and the Bigfoot was standing there, watching us. He stood there for many hours, until finally he went away. Looking back on that experience, 
Ivan and I chose not to share it with anyone. I was naturally reluctant to show my sister where my father was buried. Over the years, I'd warned her never to go into the woods, persuading her that it could be dangerous, and I'm glad she never did, and heeded to my warnings. Now she wanted to see where my father was buried. I could not deprive her of that privilege, and to lay down flowers on his resting place. I did wonder what if the Bigfoot that came close to killing me and Ivan was still around, but I persuaded myself that an encounter with the creature a second time around would be exceedingly unlikely. I mean, people all over the world were looking for the quintessential opportunity to encounter the elusive beast, and were never successful in their endeavours, so the chances of stumbling on the creature again were pretty close to remote. But nevertheless, I would go into the woods armed to ensure our safety. I do remember a month after my inauspicious encounter with the Bigfoot, my Aunt Heidi had gone into the grove to visit the grave and announced that she had found the Ouija board that Ivan and I had used to contact my father with. It had been torn to shreds, but she told me she wouldn't tell my mother about it. She picked up the pieces and discarded them in the dumpster. I guess she knew what me and Ivan had been up to. She gave me a wink and told me that my secret was safe with her. I will say this, though, love. Your mother's right. Don't go messing around with stuff you don't understand. It's not a wise thing to do. I've heard some rather unsettling stories about Ouija boards in my time. Don't worry, Aunt Heidi. I won't do it again. I don't want anything to do with that kind of stuff. Good, I'm glad to hear you say that. I hasten to say my friend Ivan had lost all interest in all things supernatural. Our encounter with the Bigfoot had stolen his interest in the paranormal, and now he would never dream of attempting to talk to the dead. So I guess some good had come out of a rather bad, tenuous situation. I had no idea who had torn up the Ouija board to shreds, but I could only assume it was the work of a very angry, irate Bigfoot. It was after my sister begged me to show her my father's grave in the woods that finally I agreed to take her to where he'd been laid to rest, as the last thing I wanted was for my sister to be wandering around the grove on her own, trying to locate the burial spot for herself. At least if I accompanied her, she would be safe and I would be armed. It was on a pretty Saturday morning in spring that we ventured into the grove. The last time I'd been in the woods had been with Ivan all those years ago. It had also been spring. But since my encounter with an aggressive Bigfoot, I had stayed the hell away and encouraged the family to do very much the same, although I had never admitted to why this was the case. I do remember my sister was carrying a big bouquet of flowers, and as we sashayed down the path through the woods, I was beginning to wonder why I had stayed away for so very long. Everything was benevolently benign. The energy of the woods was warmly welcoming. When we found my father's grave, my sister laid down her bouquet of flowers for him. For a while we both said some kind words to my father, and then we sensed something was watching us. We both looked up, and there standing in the trees was the male Bigfoot watching us. My sister observed him as well. It was the same Bigfoot that had chased me and Ivan away from the grave all those years ago. He was older, but unquestionably the same creature. I know he recognised me, as I recognised him, for he held my gaze. It was in that moment, as I looked into the Bigfoot's eyes, I saw only a tender kindness and compassion in them, and yet this very same creature had aggressively chased me and Ivan away from the woodgrove that night, when we had been playing with a Ouija board. It was then that I wondered if it was our actions that night that had provoked the Bigfoot to anger, because as he watched us through the trees... For a second he seemed curiously interested in us, but not remotely aggressive. He then nodded his head at me in a greeting, and then he glided away, and I had no time to even be afraid. My sister was thrilled that we had encountered the creature, and she said to me, They say Bigfoots are dangerous and aggressive. The creature is a big teddy bear. I remember thinking, If only you knew. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed that. Until next time, goodbye and good night.